Welcome to the webinar, WHO Europe's access to novel medicine platform and support for HTA in the WHO European region. This webinar is offered by HTAI in collaboration with WHO Europe. HTAI is the only global society championing equitable, responsive, and cutting-edge health technology assessment. Our members are a global community of multidisciplinary advisors, academics, scientists, professionals, public and private organizations, students, patients and citizens. If your interest is HTA, HTAI is the place to be. Membership provides the opportunity to join our community and to participate in robust dialogues that have a meaningful impact on local, national, and global settings. Please visit our website for more information www.htai.org. The HTAI 2024 annual meeting will take place in Seville, Spain from June 15 to June 19. Join us! Thank you for joining us today and enjoy the webinar. Thank you so much uh, for this partnership. And um, I will kickstart the webinar with uh, introducing Sarah Garner who is uh, the Senior Policy Advisor for the Access to Health and Medicine Products in uh, the WHO Regional Office for Europe, and has previously been the coordinator for innovation, access, and use um, in the Essential Medicines and Health Products Department at the headquarters in Geneva. And um, as many of you know her, and how I know her personally from before, she was the Associate Director um, at NICE in the UK and responsible for the Science Policy and Research Unit for many, many years amongst many other hats, but I don't want to take more time. So I hand it over to Sarah. To Great, thank you. Start this webinar. Thank you very much, Tarang, um, and welcome to everybody um, to the webinar. Um, HTAI um, is one of the organizations um, that is in official relations with WHO. Um, so we've been a long-standing partnership um, for many years um, with HTI providing support um, to our member state and to a number of HTA um, initiatives that support um, the delivery of the WHO resolution on health technology assessment. Um, so I'm going to start by giving some introductory remarks um, and then introduce the panellists one by one um, who will give their presentations. Um, we're going to allow um, for one or two clarification questions at the end of each presentation. Um, but what we'd like to do for you is to really save your questions to the end um, where we'll have Q&A and we hope to have um, a really in-depth discussion between everybody. Um, so I'm going to start um, by just setting the scene um, and explaining some of the work um, that we've been doing um, at WHO with regards to access to novel medicines. So Tarang, if you could please share the slides, that would be great. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So um, it always helps, I think, um, explaining a little bit about WHO. Um, as Tarang mentioned, I came to WHO from the UK's Health Technology Assessment Organization, NICE. Um, WHO is one of is the UN agency um, for coordinating health, so it's part of the United Nations. Um, it has headquarters in Geneva, but work is coordinated at a regional level from six centres globally. Um, WHO Europe um, is hosted by the Danish government um, in Copenhagen. Um, we have 53 member states in our region. It's the one with the most member states. Um, we have um, the EU, the EEA countries, the Western Balkans, um, Iceland, Turkey, Israel, the car country, Central Asian Republic countries, um, and um, countries like Moldova, uh, Georgia, Armenia, so many countries um, in the middle. So it's quite a, a, a big land mass with, um, I think it's over 900 million inhabitants now. We have four official languages in the region, 32 offices in the country. So there's a WHR representative um, in many of the countries um, and nine technical centers. Um, and the activities um, we do is we provide bilateral support to the member states in the region on request, so the government's um, requesters, and as Tarang will go through, many have requested support with HTA. Um, we provide um, convening power, so bringing stakeholders together, and we monitor um, and assess health trends um, in the region. Next slide, please, Tarang. 
Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit today talking about um, the Access to Novel Medicines platform, um, which is a unique multi-stakeholder collaboration mechanism. Um, it was launched last year um, at the regional committee after uh, two years of quite extensive technical work. Um, everybody agreed at that stage that the, the work was useful, that more multi-stakeholder discussion um, was required. So we're moving forward um, with the next gauge, which is establishing working groups. Next slide, please. Um, so the work is based um, on policy dialogues. Um, so we've been holding a series of um, bilateral, trilateral and multinational discussions um, with the member states in the region. Um, and the ones we've completed um, are on the left. Um, and basically we were discussing broadly access um, to medicines issues. So for the novel medicines and the essential medicines, um, but what we recognised um, was there some essential themes coming through, um, and this work has very much been used to inform the development of the Novel Medicines platform. Um, so just, just um, sorry, go back a bit, sorry, uh, and just to, to really um, highlight that access to all types of medicines um, is difficult at the moment in the region. So some basic medicines aren't um, registered, the shortages, um, we're working on regulatory system strengthening, um, but really what is needed um, very clearly came through that we need more transparency from all the partners um, and trust building is essential and we will achieve that through transparency. Next slide, please, Tarang. Thank you. Um, so to go back to the um, Access to Novel Medicines platform, this is really a working group. We're really now asking people to come up with concrete actions, including pilot proposals to improve affordable equitable access to effective novel high cost medicines in the region. Um, so we've had, we know what the problem is. I think we can all discuss the problems, the issues at length. What we really want now is what can we do about it? What can we do about it together? And what can we each as a stakeholder um, do individually? Um, so over the next six months, we'll be convening the working groups and I'll give you more information in a minute. Um, but we've got a number um, of specific objectives. The first one is to actually establish the collaboration mechanism itself. Um, as I said, this is a unique mechanism um, in the region. We've got many other meetings where they involve either the HTA community, the payer community, the regulators, um, patient organisations, but there's very few that um, involve all the stakeholders. And as we know, the solutions lie with all the stakeholders. Um, it's about how the individual systems interact with each other and the gaps that are happening between those systems. So we all need to agree um, on how to move forward. Um, so the first working group will be looking at transparency. So what in the region um, can we, make, what information can we make more transparent? We have a World Health Assembly transparency resolution, um, but importantly, enable better planning through horizon scanning um, and look at indicators to look at accessibility and to identify where things are going wrong and then we can um, identify corrective actions. Um, the second working group um, is looking at solidarity and this is really about voluntary collaborations. Um, we have regulations, but this is about the voluntary initiatives that could be used to complement um, the regulations. And we're particularly looking at how to better generate evidence. Um, a lot of these new medicines come to the market um, with an immature evidence base, so they, they need um, careful evidence um, generation. How can we demand aggregate? So a few patients in small countries, how can we aggregate that demand to make it easier for everybody and possibly as far um, as joint procurement initiatives. Um, sustainability, this is about principles for payment pricing and HTA, um, recognizing that we have to have sustainable healthcare systems, but we also need incentives for those medicines um, to be developed in the first place. Um, and looking at how we can better manage that market um, through governance mechanisms um, and highlight where we have market failures or needs addressed. So this is really zooming out and thinking about this as a system and about how we can um, really get that system to work better together, developing principles. And finally, we have a specific working group on um, novel antimicrobials, recognizing the, the particularities of that market um, we have a lot of different players, a lot of different initiatives. So how can we coordinate between the public and the private sectors? 
um, and look at the access principles around novel antimicrobials. And there's some really good examples um, that are being developed um, in the region. I'm thinking of um, Sweden and the UK in particular. Next slide, please, Tarang. Um, so just briefly um, talking about the working groups, we've got an absolutely fabulous set of chairs. So I'm very grateful to all of them um, and to the vice chairs um, for supporting this week, this work. Um, the first working group on transparency um, will be chaired by Francis Arex, who I'm sure everybody um, will be familiar. So he's um, the policy advisor for RISIV Inami in Belgium, and we're having the face-to-face -face meeting 5th to 6th of December. The second working group, Solidarity, which is the evidence generation and uh, demand pooling, will be chaired by the Deputy Minister for Health for Czechia, Jakub Dvorak. Um, and that meeting is going to be held in three weeks' time in Prague. Mindet Boyson, Head of International Affairs at NICE, um, will be chairing Working Group 3, um, and we're going to be holding this, this that one's on the pricing, um, HTA principles um, and governance. Um, we'll be meeting in Manchester um, in March next year. And finally, thank you to Sweden to, to um, for um, hosting and chairing the, the special group on antimicrobial resistance, and we're hoping to meet in May next year. Next slide. Um, so I think that then brings me, I think next is for me to um, introduce Tarang um, in the team. Um, so Tarang is a technical officer um, for the Access to Novel Medicines platform. I'm absolutely delighted um, she's joined uh, us at WHO to work on this platform. Um, so her, her role is for strategic cooperation between the stakeholders for improving access. Um, she's previously worked on new COVID vaccines, COVID-19 vaccine access at WHO, HQ, sorry, and evidence to policy mechanisms um, at WHO, HQ and regional office. And she's also worked, we work together um, at NICE on HTA um, in the UK and the Danish Medicines Council. So Tarang, over to you to highlight um, the HTA work that WHO is doing. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and as Sarah said, she's highlighted the work of the Novel Medicines platform, really, which is sort of an overarching um, uh, work where we hope actually HTA sort of fits in, in into all elements around manage access uh, entry agreements in terms of transparency, as well as the evidence generation for many of these products in the second working group, as well as the principles for pricing reimbursement in HTA in the third. And, um, and and all those um, elements within AMR. But apart from that, we're also doing actual work uh, with individual member states and across the whole region for health technology assessment, as well as their linking to health benefit package. And I thought I will just briefly talk about that as well. So uh, this actually is, I think Sarah mentioned it in her introduction that we have a resolution on health technology assessment at WHO um, this is from the World Health Assembly uh, uh, Resolution 67.23, which as a result um, made us uh, to have a big global survey on health technology assessment. Um, and that was its first iteration in 2015. So we get uh, data and input on uh, health technology assessment from all of the globally, from all uh, countries that are members of WHO, and that is 53 members in uh, of our region as well. And then the next iteration was the was the one I have put up here, which is the one from 2020, 2021, where um, we realized that maybe some of them, some of the countries had um, HTA happening or they had health technology assessment in some form, but it wasn't always linked to the health benefit package or to actual financing schemes that was actually then providing access uh, to the medicines. Um, and so we broadened the scope to include HTA, but as well as health benefit package um, uh, in that survey and also the links or lack of thereof so we have a better understanding of what's happening and this is available from our website and you can look at individual countries through the dashboard um, and also take out pdf so you get individual country data as needed and of course this is where we work and partner with the national agencies and the ministries to get that data so it's as rich as the data we get but it's improving. So from the 2015 iteration to the last one in 2020, 2021, we got a lot more. So we could also see the evolution and the growth uh, of this area uh, uh, globally and definitely in our region. That said, uh, we had a discussion with our member states 
um, and they felt that we could actually now optimize our survey itself um, and tweak it. And we've been doing this with pilot uh, key increment interviews and it's across all regions. And for our region, we are doing it. Uh, we have actually completed this in Georgia, Ukraine, um, the Kingdom of Netherlands, and we are initiating it now in Moldova. Of course, as you will see, um, there's an interest to have it in one of the countries from the European Union, um, that is the Kingdom of Netherlands that also hosted uh, UNETA and the UNETA 21 most recently um, uh, to get a sense of where they're moving in the European uh, landscape, but also the accession countries um, where there's a lot of interest to see, develop and improve uh, not only the health technology assessment uh, structures and mechanisms in the country, but also the links to how they then fit in with the health benefit packages um, so that there's actual access um, given to patients for the medicines they need. Um, and we, this is some detail. So you can see we are working with the relevant HDA stakeholders in the country, and they could be many in some of them, um, but also with other partners. So we make sure our work is uh, aligned. We've done also some uh, bilateral work with countries, and I've just taken out a few examples to show uh, and you will hear uh, much more about the work that's been happening in Estonia from Merilis uh, soon after. Um, and they've been working to update their guidelines um, and we just provide a sounding board. So it's actually quite minimal at the moment, but we're hoping to uh, see what they have learned from their stakeholders through the process of their guidelines to update, um, to send to industry about their health technology assessment um, and so that they are listening to what is happening uh, in our region and other relevant uh, countries and learn from that and then decide what works best for them and for the new guidance for the country. Um, with uh, Latvia, we have, we have been working with uh, to do a full review of the health benefit package system to see uh, how those medicines end up in, in the list and um, ensure that they are coming from evidence-informed sources, such as health technology assessments, um, before they get reimbursed. Uh, with Georgia, we've been working around rare rare diseases and to see uh, how the mechanisms work for orphan drugs. And they've been working and developing a process so that it's complementary to the existing systems instead of creating uh, things from scratch and in, in just making sure that it's fit for purpose for also orphan drugs. With Moldova, we're about to kickstart a horizon scanning uh, and health technology assessment support uh, and to ensure that they are underpinning evidence and we're probably gonna start uh, with the essential medicines list for oncology um, and then maybe broaden uh, to all, all, all clinical areas. But this is just a quick snapshot of what we're doing um, in a bilateral way. We of course working till now, of course it's over with UNETA to ensure we are aligned um, going forward with the heads of HDA agencies um, and very closely with the commission with their group, as well as with the coordinating group on health technology assessment. Um, and uh, uh, of course, we are making sure that the countries that are sitting outside the union in our region um, that are not uh, getting access to this information sharing and, and, and knowledge that we are providing that bridge and support definitely to the accession countries, but also wider uh, in our region. And I think uh, I just wanted to highlight one of the examples of the policy dialogues that Sarah had highlighted at the start. This is one uh, we did with the Small Countries Initiative. Um, and you can see we've now been given the mandate to work with the small countries. And you see the ones listed there, uh, which are involved. Um, they are sort of the countries with the, uh, less than 2 million inhabitants. So the problems most countries are facing in Europe, they are sort of just magnified uh, due to small numbers. Um, and now we are in partnership formally to support them in horizon scanning activities and health technology assessment. And we will be taking that work forward um, uh, at, at the next meeting, uh, uh, which is planned next year, uh, hosted by Cyprus. And I think that's sort of it from my end. So I'm gonna hand over back to Sarah and stop sharing. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Tarang. Um, I'm just going to encourage everybody to put some questions um, and answers in there. I've got one 
from Neil, which I'll come to. Um, but Tarang, I wondered um, if you could explain a little bit about um, WHO's engagement with the Ministries for Health um, and then also how the partnerships work um, with the HTA community, because we have, have a number of great organisations we're working with, um, uh, including through World Bank funding. Yes. OK, so I should actually have take a step back as as part of the WHO mandate, we work or we're the secretariat supporting member states. So these are national governments uh, and we work directly. We have uh, uh, technical counterparts and national counterparts within each ministry for the 53 countries um, or within our region. And of course that uh, expands to the 190 plus uh, uh, globally. And uh, we then have the political counterparts and then our technical counterparts for our particular work. And they are our sort of direct access to the country um, and focus. And as Sarah had also mentioned earlier, in some of these countries, so not in all 53, but 30 odd countries, we have a small local presence. So we have a country office that have a direct and sort of almost a daily engagement with the ministry and the local structures um, therein. So where we do have these uh, local offices, we can work with partnership with them to work with the ministry to highlight the priorities. And they, it's very much a needs, needs base uh, kind of way of working where they come up to us for the support and priorities they have and where they would like WHO to support and provide um, assistance. And HDA has definitely come across uh, quite strongly in many of these. And we, uh, I think we do have a history as WHO to work with non-state actors. So these are um, uh, NGOs, civil society, and organizations that are not government. Uh, I think this hasn't been actively pursued in the way it could have and optimized. And I think what has been really well done uh, by Sarah and colleagues through the Oslo Medicines Initiative, which was the predecessor to the work we are working on now on the Novel Medicines platform to really highlight the importance of um, other sectors that are playing this. And for the first time, I think it's really the first time where we not only are engaging with um, uh, NGOs and civil society, but also very, very happy to have, uh, like Matthias present here today, the industry bodies um, working with us and Bettina as part of the um, uh, NGOs. And I don't know, Sarah, uh, we can say, okay. but she's very actively involved in very much going to be actively involved in one of the working groups. And so is Matthias uh, himself personally. Um, and it's really about bringing everybody together to discuss and find solutions rather than, you know, butting heads and talking and agreeing in, in silos because I think everybody agrees in their own little groups, but we really won't move forward and solve the problems that we have at hand if we do that in isolation. So um, I think it's been really quite fantastic being able to do this. Okay, that's it. I stop. That's perfect. Yeah, no, I'm just a little bit conscious of the time. We've got three speakers to go. Um, short question from Neil. And Neil, just to say thank you very much for all the updates that you put on LinkedIn. They're very much appreciated. They're very useful. Um, so thank you. Very, very clear. Um, so Neil's question um, is much of the work to date seems to have focused on Central Eastern Europe. What role does Western Europe play in the activity of the platform? Um, so just to clarify, um, the, a lot of the bilateral work that we do with Ministries for the Health tends to be um, in the middle income countries, because obviously the higher income countries have well established systems. So the bilateral work um, is Central and Eastern Europe, um, and it's developing the entire medicine system from the regulatory systems, the benefit packages, which medicines going to benefit packages, how to procure, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then what role does Western Europe play in the activity of the platform? Um, the answer is that it's all 53 member states. Um, we recognise the issues are different depending on your context um, and that HTA pricing are member state um, competencies. However, we believe there's common themes um, amongst them. Um, many small countries, smaller countries in Europe um, with few, pa few numbers of patients. So how can we identify and align um, these systems, I think, for everybody's benefit. So um, without any further ado, Marilis, I'm going to introduce you. Thank you for joining us. Um, Marilis um, is an analyst at the Centre for Health Technology Assessment um, and a lecturer at the Institute of Family Medicine and Public Health at the University of Tartu. 
and she's currently leading a dedicated working group focused on updating the Estonian guidelines for HTA assessment. Marilis, over to you. Thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you. Hello, everybody. It's it's great to be here. I have just put up my slides here. I hope you can see them. Yes, thank you. I, I see nodding. OK, so yeah, I am representing the HTA Center in Estonia, and I am here today to uh, uh, to tell you a bit about how we approach the uh, updating the HTA guideline uh, for Estonia. So first, uh, how did it uh, come up, <laughs> the need to update the guideline? Uh, uh, firstly, well, the present guideline was adopted in 2002. It is quite general in wording, so it doesn't mean that it's uh, it's very much outdated, but it does need a bit refreshing, uh, pro probably because, or mostly because there are so many New, new topics and discussions that uh, I don't think 20 years ago people even uh, dreamt about. And also the second kind of starting point for the update uh, was that last year an analysis of the HD process in Estonia uh, was conducted. And here uh, I have to, I want to give you a bit of background information. Uh, in Estonia, we have universal health coverage system um, and uh, this means that uh, the National Health Insurance Fund is the main buyer of health services uh, and other health, health technologies, including uh, medicines and medicinal products. Uh, and so this also means that the fund is responsible for price agreements with the manufacturers of, of the health technologies of the medicines. So uh, they get to handle all the applications and with this, uh, uh, most of the uh, health technology assessment information uh, starts from, from the fund. And in some cases, uh, some uh, assessments need kind of a more different approach or more thorough investigation. And those uh, uh, those works end up uh, on our table in the HTA Center. But I'm not here today to talk about uh, our center, but, uh, but about the guideline. So uh, important to know here is that uh, the health insurance fund uh, is uh, is kind of the center at the center uh, of the of the HDA uh, uh, processes uh, in Estonia, <clears throat> and uh, they are using uh, the HDAs to uh, uh, to inform their reimbursement uh, decisions. Uh, okay, moving back to the guideline following. Uh, the, the analysis last year, um, several suggestions uh, were made regarding the HDA process in general, uh, what needs improving, what needs refreshing and so on. And so there was a clear expression of will to renew and where appropriate also the update the process uh, for preparing and evaluating claims for reimbursement and uh, also to update the guideline for health technology assessment. Uh, so the guideline update uh, is based on uh, gathering best practices uh, from uh, from different countries, uh, uh, going over the literature, uh, going over different research from different countries, uh, and also uh, it relies on stakeholders' input. And for that, uh, uh, a special working group was assembled uh, by the fund to discuss some specific issues. And uh, in updating the guideline, we have also had great support from WHO, who has given given us advice on what information to look for and what are the current practices uh, and developments in other countries. So big, big thanks to WHO uh, from our side. Uh, so as the guideline uh, is intended to be uh, used uh, by the manufacturers, uh, by the health insurance fund, and uh, HDA bodies in Estonia, we have only one HDA body, but maybe there will be others. So there are several different parties who would be using the HDA guideline. Uh, so therefore, the, the working group uh, needed to be uh, quite, uh, quite diverse, involving different uh, stakeholders. And as you can see, we have here representatives from different organizations. We have the patient's uh, organization representative. We have... Uh, uh, the Ministry of Social Affairs, we have the State Agency of Medicines, uh, 
uh, and the Association of uh, Pharmaceutical Manufacturers in Estonia. Uh, the Health Insurance Fund, of course, is present and uh, our HTS Center, and uh, we are uh, chairing the working group. And also, it's uh, our task to put together the, the materials for the guideline and uh, and have it have it look look nice. Uh, just a quick overview of the meeting topics. For the topics, the present guideline and the results of the uh, uh, last year's report are uh, uh, are our main starting point. So we are kind of going over uh the the materials that we have and trying to understand what needs updating what needs adding what can be changed uh, one of the first things uh, we we changed uh, is is the title uh, the guideline from 20 years ago focuses on pharmaceuticals uh, but now uh, we uh, are, are of course changing the title uh, uh, for health technologies and we are it's not definitely focused only on on pharmaceuticals and we have our we have monthly meetings uh, with the working group, and as you can see, uh, we have now uh, in August and September we have arrived to the ICER discussions. Uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, all the parties in the working group agree that it's uh, it's one of the most important and uh, one of the most difficult discussions. Uh, we are somewhere in the middle of. Uh, of those talks, uh, we are still we are continuing next week, and uh, if needed, we will take more time because uh, there's really uh, lots of uh, lots of different angles uh, to to cover here. And so, uh, considering the, today's webinar topics, uh, the rare diseases and the real world data for novel medicines, I would say uh, so far so good. Uh, we have. Uh, we we come up uh, with the rare diseases topic almost every meeting. Whatever is the thing we are actually discussing, uh, if it's uh, it can be whatever, so it always comes up. And uh, mostly right now, it's of course a very hot topic in relation to ICER threshold discussions. Um, but uh, we have also uh, discussed uh, uh, rare diseases uh, in the context of uh, of evidence or maybe to be more specific, lack, lack of evidence and how to approach these situations. Uh, and also, mm, there is actually a larger question uh, related to that, uh, the, the question of definition, because uh, Estonia is a very small, quite small country, and, uh, mm, and we have to figure out uh, uh, how to define even a rare disease uh, in a country where there are uh, not so many not so many people and currently uh, there are, there are some uh, some different uh, definitions in use uh, compared to uh, maybe some other countries or, or compared to maybe what is uh, more generally uh, used uh, with uh, real world uh, evidence uh, i can right now just say that uh, mm, it's uh, it's also a larger topic, of course, uh, and uh, uh, there is in the working group a definite consensus on acceptability of real world evidence. Uh, nobody has yet said that uh, it should be disregarded uh, all the time. However, there is a question of quality of the data and uh, the how the, the how the methodology is described. So it needs to be uh, very clear what is used, uh, how is used, and of course, why is it used? Why is it uh, is it really that there is no other possibility um, to uh, to gather evidence uh, evidence for something? So it's it's not just uh, whether uh, we accept uh, we accept this or not, but uh, how it is used. Uh, to, uh, for, for Estonia, as I said, we have the National Health Insurance Fund, which means that uh, there is actually quite extensive uh, uh, database, uh, uh, the claims data, and this is actually a database that is uh, quite a lot used in Estonia for other purposes uh, besides what the Health Insurance Fund is doing daily. And uh, when uh, we think about real world evidence in Estonia, we almost instantly think about uh, the 
uh, claims database it's used uh, in studies it can be used of course uh, we have to keep in mind that there are limitations this is a database uh, uh, of, of medical claims uh, and it's initially not meant uh, for conducting research but still uh, this is something uh, I think that uh, can be used and uh, we have to we want to find ways to make use of this uh, of this uh, data that we have already uh, there and uh, yeah I, I think I have to I'm going to stop here <laughs> I understand that may, I may not have given you very much detailed information and there is a reason for that uh, the working group is still working there are discussions going on uh, and we are we have agreed that we are not going to uh, kind of uh, talk about the agreements uh, uh, before everything is put together and all the discussions uh, are, are done. So if everything goes to plan in about six months, maybe we have the guideline together. And of course, then we will be happy to go around and uh, tell more how we how we reach, reach the agreements and what sort of agreements uh, did we reach. So thank you again for inviting me. Thank you very much, Marilis, for a very um, informative um, walk through the work that Estonia is doing. And I think we're all going to be watching with interest um, about how Estonia is dealing with some of the challenges these novel high cost medicines present, few, few numbers of patients, um, high um, increment cost effective ratios, the impact on the budget, real world evidence, et cetera. So, so thank you very much. Um, I have one question in the chat um, from Aiga. So lovely to hear from you, Aiga. Um, the short answer is please get in touch. We'd love to see about how we can get um, Poland involved. So thank you. Um, and then I'm going to hand over Bettina. I think it's your turn. Um, so just to introduce Bettina, um, I thank you very much for joining um, with us. Um, so Bettina is the founder of Melanoma Patient Network Europe, and she was a member of the first EU Cancer Mission Board. Um, Bettina is a physician by training and has a PhD in biomedical sciences from the University College London. Um, and Bettina became a patient advocate after losing her husband um, to melanoma. Um, so as many of you who have worked with Bettina, you can really see that drive um, in all her approach, um, really, really ensuring that the, the focus is on the patients and patient centric innovation. So Bettina, over to you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. It's an absolute pleasure here. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Sarah and Tarang, for all the work you put into a, a topic that is actually very close to my heart. As you have already heard, um, I lost my husband and he died of melanoma. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with melanoma, melanoma is one of these diseases where new medicines have made an enormous difference um, in a very short amount of time. So my husband was diagnosed in 2011 and died in 2012. And at the time, median survival at five, year, at five years was below 5%. And today we're looking at a five-year survival of above 50%. So from a disease where everyone basically died to one where half of the patients are surviving and truly surviving because while we are staring at the updates of the essential trials and this tail of the curve is just not dropping it is like something that is as close to medical uh, miracle if I may use that word uh, than anything we can imagine however um what was not so great in that experience is that, well, personally, of course not, but I started a, a European patient network. And one of the first concerns that I saw that access across Europe was not equal. And you can imagine if you are coming from a condition where everyone dies to one where suddenly people survive and access is not ensured, you it's like a double hit. It's not the disease that is threatening, it's the disease and your system that is threatening you. And that is an experience that um, is, is one of the main motivators why I am kind of why I'm share have, that well have a, become so active in this topic and I'm just realizing that I'm not sharing my that I'm not in a, a presentation mode. So what I or we have community started. So I was particularly interested in having a network that was active in very diverse countries. And I don't have to tell this audience that our systems are very different. Uh, they're culturally anchored. We have different languages, different organizational models. Um, and so I was very interested to be close to the patients in these 
diverse countries. And of course, no single person can do that. So we use a networked approach. And something that we did actually quite a while back is then we were worrying about this access situation that we started simply mapping. Without data, you're nothing. So we use a crowdsourced approach where we go through the EMA approved uh, products um, in what well, EMA recommended and then with the market authorization in Europe. And we go country by country. And I just show you a snapshot how you can do this. So uh, we do this quite regularly. And then we have access maps. We are currently updating access to uh, therapy system, uh, systematic therapies in stage two. And what came out if we looked through, so basically what we did is we looked at the therapies and then where they were in the process, we knew they had market authorization, but then where they were at country level. And this is what came out of that. And this is what I call the big black hole of access. So in an early phase, there is clinical trials, and this is now obviously dependent on, on whether a country actually has clinical trials available. And that is one of our motivations to advocate and to support the, the, the establishment, the setup, and the support of clinical trials in as many countries as possible, but uh, clinical trials effectively provide access to novel therapies. However, uh, when these trials ended and the, these products were um, submitted for, for evaluation, we ended up something that is really like a black hole and the HDA component contributed or was part, taking part in this hole. Before there was an assessment, finally a reimbursement decision and then utilization. We've seen delays everywhere, but that particular hole is particularly bad for patients. So one of my motivations and something I plead for is that we tackle this hole. And that means that HTA has to happen, in my opinion, like earlier. And this is why I've been very active in any initiatives that work, let's say, for example, at the EMA and HTA corporations, because I think anything we can do there to shorten and tighten that gap will save lives for, for therapies that will become av uh, available eventually anyway. And that for me is like I always say, this is on the left side of the screen, you have an invention, you have something that's nice um, and that has a potential, but that makes no difference to our societies. If we want to turn it into innovation, we have to get this process right. So that is my, my motivation. And this is something that we have consistently seen. Now, if I move to the next slide, um, we're not just mapping. So I've been very recently, and this is a publication from this June, involved in, because of course, access, especially to novel medicine, often comes with a high degree of uncertainty. Um, how can we manage these uncertainties? So I have involved in numerous initiatives, and this is a recent publication from this year, and this is an HTAI, a DIA joint working group, and that has been very constructive. And what I liked about it is that it was pragmatic and tried to find concrete tools that can help actually decision makers to tackle this uncertainty. We can say uncertainty is a problem, but I would like to see a way how do we address it because otherwise we're not moving forward. Now in the next few slides, I would like to share something that I'm currently working on um, that I think is a very interesting example how one can concretely tackle both access as well as evidence generation as well as health technology assessment. And now this is uh, concerning precision medicine. This is an initiative of the, uh, it's an implementation initiatives of pragmatic um, precision medicine clinical trials based on the original DRIP trial that was established and published also in the Netherlands. And I always, I say it became something like a medical TikTok because other countries picked up the protocol and then started establishing independently on them by themselves. And I think that alone is already an interesting approach because there's no centralized organization. People ran with the protocol because they felt it was valuable. And what happened then is that in order to make this work, they had to engage with their decision makers. And usually this is not what we see so often. Usually a clinical trial is a clinical trial and it's a bit of a standalone unit and exists on its own. And then the results get handed over and then something you know moves in a kind of conveyor belt session. While this one is very different. And this is something that I thought was extremely interesting what our Dutch colleagues negotiated or set up in their countries and that has been uh, inspiring others and that others have picked up, notably Norway, but others are considering as well is that they had a shared approach in terms of access for the provision of the drug for this trial. And it is basically a pragmatic outcome-based risk sharing agreement where the manufacturer provides drug for the first 16 weeks. If the patient has a, has a, has a response at that time, the healthcare system will continue paying for the cost. 
Obviously, those patients who do not benefit get taken off drug. And it is important to note that these are approved drugs. So we're talking basically a repurposing setting, uh, an extension of label, if you want. So in that setting, you have a pragmatic outcome-based risk sharing between a manufacturer and a payer. And what happens then is that this is not just happening in the world, but the data gets captured in a set form in order to fill cohorts and to generate solid evidence packages that then get submitted to the national HTA body that evaluates. And based on that, um, pembrolizumab was reimbursed for MSI high patients. So what is interesting in there that we have basically reinverted access and HTA assessment because for precision medicine, this is one of the, what I call the catch 22. We have to, um, for, if you think about precision medicine or in a traditional way, we will generate evidence and afterwards we implement. The problem with precision medicine is that we require a large amount of data and for that, we first have to implement just in order to generate the evidence. And for that, we need a different type of setup. And we have already heard that smaller countries like Estonia face particular problems because just populations are small. So many of our countries in Europe are small. So we have to collaborate. And I'm very delighted to say that we also have a DLC, a DLCT stands for DRIP-like clinical trials. So we also have Estonian colleagues in the project who are working on a setup for Estonia. So I think models like this help us to find a constructive way forward. And before now someone thinks like precision medicine, that's high tech medicine, that's just for the very wealthy. I would like to remind you if you haven't followed IC2 Permed, which is an initiative between the European Union and China, China deliberately sets on precision medicine to go into the early setting. They are worried about their aging population and they want to move as early as possible. And they see it as an important part to increase the sustainability of the healthcare system by basically moving resources to where they have the largest impact and removing them from areas where they would just cause damage or no benefit at all. And we've had before the war, uh, the Ukraine war, we had similar discussions with Russia with the same rationale that these countries are moving into precision medicine to for the very same reason. So it is not something, it is different from the way we think about it, but I do believe it is an important part actually uh, for the sustainability in, in the long-term view for our healthcare systems. For so that, I would like to thank you and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Bettina. And I was just about to give you your one minute warning. So you finished perfectly on time. Um, so absolutely great. Um, I'm seeing one Q&A in there from someone anonymous. Um, please, can you explain what is known about possible reasons for the black hole? And then it could be due to launch strategies by the marketing authorization holders and in other cases, the assessment and pricing reimbursement system. So what, what do you know about why we have black holes? So the thing is that the first one is definitely um, a mixed problem. So there are different factors contributing to the black hole and the reasons for the black hole are different from country to country. But we see it is basically, a, it is an addition of all the listed ones, later submissions, delay in the process, lack of capacity in local decision maker bodies, deliberate delays just to wait for price erosion. Um, then of course we have the impact of reference pricing on top of everything. So it's a compound black hole, if you like. So it's unfortunately not one thing. It is tech, something we have to think at system level. I'm just very motivated to shrink the hole because that's where we lose patients. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that, accords with our observations as well from WHO that this is a multifactorial issue um, and the solutions lie with everybody um, to um, address it and play, the, play their bit. Um, thank you very much, Bettina. I'm going to now pass over to Matthias. So Matthias is the Public Affairs and Policy Manager for UCOP um, and he is supporting UCUP on a number of topics, including implementation of EU HTA, advanced diagnostics, real world evidence, patient package, Europe's beating cancer plan and relevant market access topics. Um, Matthias has broad background, um, so previously advocated on behalf of European cancer patients and worked with the Norwegian Social Security Administration on the reimbursement of medical devices and also coordination of social security within the EU EEA. So Matthias, a great all round background. Um, welcome. And I'll hand over to you. Well, thank you very much uh, for running running through all of that. That's true. Uh, I have a broad background, uh, but um... I think uh, I will try to keep it a bit focused here in, in the remaining minutes. 
Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so yes, uh, I wanted to just maybe first start by reflecting, you know, what is actually HDA for? I mean, it's, it's becoming increasingly an important key tool for healthcare decision makers. And it's really about reducing uncertainty. So, you know, we will never have zero, zero uh, uncertainty or full certainty, but it's about reducing uncertainty in the decision making, both around the clinical aspects, uh, the claimed health benefits of pharmaceutical or medical device, and ensuring the patients receive effective treatments. This is, you know, the clinical aspect of it. And around the economic aspects, of course, informing the price and reimbursement decisions and ensuring a return on investment for governments that, that spend on health products and also for the companies uh, based on the perceived value of the product. So um, while it's becoming a, an, an important tool, uh, it could also bear the risk of extending time for required for patients' access. We heard this from Bettina. She spoke about uh, the black hole. It's, uh, I would echo that it is a multifactorial issue where, uh, where each actor uh, plays their part. Um, and of course, if HA is not implemented correctly, we end up with this black hole and it becomes a barrier to introducing new innovative products to the European market. Um, from our perspective, um, companies or drug developers are really key stakeholders in HDA as they're really the ones that are gathering the evidence and conducting the clinical trials and analysis that are needed to answer the questions from um, assessors or HDA bodies. Um, and uh, we, have, we have some examples uh, recently of uh, what happens when, when there is a negative HDA outcome, which uh, really unfortunately um, resulted in products not being available uh, in the European market. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so uh, I would like to reflect on, you know, what are some of the, the, the challenges with HDA? I think this is, a, this is an evolving tool. It's an, an evolving uh, in terms of the methodologies and the procedures as well that we are applying. So and there's really, um, uh, when we look at uh, the EU, there is an heterogeneous approach to, to HDA currently. Um, so just within the EU, there are seven, 27 different different HDA procedures with different requirements, uh, priorities, also uh, different health uh, realities. Um, and this, uh, of course, uh, complicates this. Uh, it adds to the, the time and the administrative and financial efforts for the developers uh, uh, when they have to prepare the, these evidence packages for assessors, and particularly then for small to mid-sized companies that are often at the forefront of innovation. Um, uh, another issue is the one-size-fits-all approaches. They're not suited for certain disease areas and technologies. I was very happy to hear uh, from the colleague from Estonia that they're, when they're reviewing their uh, guidance now, that they are really uh, paying consideration to the specificities of uh, rare disease, products for rare disease, or for medicinal products. Uh, we have seen that this uh, requires a tailored approach. Uh, um, uh, I think Sarah and, and uh, Taryn can speak to this as well from NICE, where they have, they have an uh, adopted uh, pathway. Um, and we know that while the, the randomized controlled trials are really the, the gold standard for HDA, some exceptional circumstances, whether it be ethical or practical issues, can, can really prevent this, this traditional approach to evidence generation. And, and so, uh, yeah, we see this for orphan medicinal products in particular, and also in, in for ATMPs as well, or advanced therapy medicinal products, which is really highly specialized technologies, smaller patient groups. Um, uh, another uh, challenge with HDA is, is that there is a limited use of value-based pricing currently and pay-for-performance models. This is also alluded to by Bettina. We'll come back to this. Um, HDA is often not the only determinant uh, in uh, pricing and reimbursement decisions. So external reference pricing, price control measures uh, can be systematically applied in those decisions. And when we do that, we move away from having a value-based pricing where it's really a, a, a comparison uh, based on that HDA assessment and, and we move into more of a, um, a, a cost control um, um, approach. Um, so we believe that by having this, this really based on the value that this technology uh, is bringing, then you can really talk about uh, you know, introducing uh, new technologies that are really more, more effective, bring more value to patients, and then relying less on other technologies that are not doing that when, when they're not uh, uh, having the same outcome in, in the HDA. We also know pharmacoeconomic models may not factor in some incremental innovation, so around the patient preferences and the opportunity cost or offset costs with adopting new technologies and how that impacts um, reliance on social services, for example. We need to think about the, the pharmacoeconomic models here as well. And uh, as, uh, as Bettina mentioned, you know, pay performance models, they can really provide this uh, risk sharing, they can help alleviate 
there's concerns around uncertainties that could not be fully answered within an HDA because we cannot always fully answer everything within the HDA. And we, we do have this time perspective where we want to bring uh, these, these uh, therapies to, uh, to patients once they have been proven to be uh, safe and effective by the EMA. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we have, uh, luckily we have a great new opportunity with the new UHA procedure. I don't want to go too much into this uh, due to the, the limited time we have today, but um, I think this is the, the, the main benefit of the new UHA procedure is that it takes that clinical assessment part uh, that is being replicated 27 different times over currently. Uh, and it aims to set up a, a one-stop shop for, for doing those clinical assessment at the EU level. Now, what is important here is, of course, that as we're setting up a new procedure, is that uh, we make sure that it actually replaces the, the current procedures so we, so we don't just end up with one additional step. It's also really important that uh, when, we, when we set up this new procedure that is then supposed to replace national procedures, is that it... Um, that it's uh, that we take what we have learned from those national procedures around, you know, providing joint scientific consultations uh, so that you can have an early dialogue around the evidence generation in so order to arrive at a really robust and quality evidence package for the assessors. Um, we need to make sure again that we reflect, you know, that methodologies uh, reflect the specificities of OMPs and other specialized technologies such as ATMPs. Um, due to the, these differences between member states, there are some questions around how you arrive at, uh, at, the, at the, the scope for uh, a European assessment. I mean, I believe here you, you need to involve the stakeholders, uh, involve the developers, involve clinicians, involve patients that understand uh, the, the disease, uh, that um, where clinicians see patients understand this, patients, of course, living with the disease in order to, uh, to arrive at, um, at um, a scope that is relevant for all of Europe. For these assessments uh, and of course uh, involving experts in in some uh, areas such as uh, rare disease might be challenging but it's, it's really crucial I think we can go to uh, just uh, to my last slide because I'm looking at time can go to the next one please yeah, so uh, I think uh, I want to highlight here really um, that, you know, in order to evolve HDA to meet the future needs, it is about implementation of value-based pricing over those cost-driven pricing mechanisms. I believe it is about knowledge and specificities of those technologies required HDA approaches. We have seen that that is happening and that's really positive. Um, we see it's, it's about increased use of real-world evidence. In Estonia, I believe they had adopted electronic health records back in 2007. They were really ahead of the game here. We see now Europe is, is catching up with the European health data space. This is really positive. It's going to help provide more useful information for HTA. Um, and then we don't have to wait. We can use that together with, um, with uh, value-based pricing models, risk-sharing models. Uh, and, and hopefully uh, be able to bring uh, those therapies to patients faster in that way. And by faster, I also mean not just the same countries, but also to uh, bring it faster to those countries that have traditionally been lagging behind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Matthias. And it's it's very interesting to see um, the same themes reflected in all the presentations, but from slightly different perspectives. Um, so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the discussions we're going to have um, under the Access to Novel Medicines platform. So thank you. Um, we're right at the end um, of the time. Unfortunately, it would have been lovely to get into some of these issues with questions and answers. I wish we had another hour, but we don't. Um, so I'm just going to thank you all um, for joining us on the webinar, to the speakers, and particularly to Tarang and colleagues at HTAI for their coordination and hosting. Um, so with that, I'll say thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your afternoons. Goodbye.